Welcome to It's Bloody Complicated, the Compass podcast. I'm Neil Lawson, your host and director of Compass. Joining me to help manage the questions is Grace Barnett from the Compass office. Hello, Grace. Hello. These are unprecedented times and we need to rise to the new and enormous challenges we now face. Over the next few weeks, we'll be speaking with writers, thinkers, politicians, journalists and public service workers about how we come out of this mess in much better shape than we went in, a good society after COVID-19. These conversations have live access for Compass members who can put their own questions directly to our guests. If you'd like to participate in a live call and help support all of our work, go to compassonline.org.uk forward slash podcast to join Compass today. Otherwise, sit back, relax and enjoy this week's podcast. So the virus impacts on everyone, but it impacts on them differently. Joining us this week to discuss the crisis and the future of progressive politics is Lisa Nandy, the Labour MP for Wigan and now Shadow Foreign Secretary. Lisa has been a long-term friend of Compass and was a member of our management committee who actually turned up and helped us a lot while she was on the committee. She was also with Caroline Lucas and Chris Bowers of a hugely important book to us called The Alternative. Um, She's well known for her work on towns. Indeed, she set up the Centre for Towns. Um, and she shone incredibly brightly during the Labour leadership election. Um, but then we always knew that she was good a long time before anybody else. So, Lisa Nandy, hello. Um, how are you? And tell us, where are you? We're so excited to know. It sort of feels like one of those games, like, where's Wally? Um, <laughs> can anyone guess from looking behind me? I'm not in a prison, is, is the clue. Um, so I'm actually, weirdly, um, somewhere in Keir Starmer's constituency, I'm not entirely sure where, but somewhere near Euston, um, such is my crazy life that I came down to Parliament for a vote that never happened. Um, and I'm now currently loitering somewhere near Euston Station, waiting to get the train home. Not in the station, I should add, otherwise I would have a face mask on. And, and some security guard is going to come and move you along at any minute or... <laughs> <laughs> or arrest me or something. And, uh, and, and, and all that toing and froing, how are you? Um, uh, it's been a difficult few months, I guess, like everyone in the country, you know, my family, you know, we've had to struggle with not seeing each other, um, got both parents that live alone. That's been quite difficult for all of us. Um, we're, we're really overwhelmed in the constituency with just the sheer number of job losses, you know, people having to take pay cuts, people really worried about their family who are you know a lot of the country is still working has not been on lockdown so and and Wigan is no exception to that we have a lot of public sector and key workers so it's been it's been a lot but there has been another side to it which I suspect would appeal to you Neil which is that you know there's been time with family and things that I've been an MP now for 10 years I haven't really been able to do before I ran for leader we also had the general election the most bruising in my you know my political lifetime and for, like for all those reasons actually just being at home with my little boy and being able to see my family and spend a bit of time and see my neighbours a lot and feel very rooted and that, you know that feeling of a community coming together all those things have been really important so you know my hope for what comes next is that we hold on to the things that we've discovered and remembered through this crisis as well as correcting some of the things that we've clearly got so badly wrong over the last few decades. Yeah, it feels like a really massive moment, doesn't it? I mean, the biggest I've ever experienced in my life, which is a lot longer than everybody else's, but it does feel <laughs> tremendous, doesn't it? In, in all good ways and bad ways. It just feels like a big sort of reset moment, really. Yeah. But I suppose the caution about that is that, you know, on the left, we've got this kind of mythology about ourselves that we sort of, you know, we came through the Second World War and we built the welfare state out of the ashes of all of that. that of course all of that is true and I'm very proud to be in a political party that played a big part in that but there's a sort of sense that of inevitability somehow about all of that that you have these moments of crisis and then everything starts to get better and actually you know the post-war years were very difficult built a new settlement which has lasted but we've been defending it ever since we've been in retreat for a lot of that time we were out of power within six years of, of winning that election. You know, there, there, there's a caution here, I suppose. The future only gets better if we make it so. And what happens next is not inevitable. It's up to us. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and the creeping kind of tentacles of one more heave 
they're always around the Labour Party, aren't they? Whoever the leader is, or whether it's a left-wing person or a right-wing person, that seems to be a sentiment that's kind of pervasive around Labour. Yeah, I just, I feel, you know, a lot of the country as well at this moment has been very, very focused on their own families, on survival. And there's a, you know, there's always a sort of feeling in Westminster anyway, in the 10 years I've been in it, that somehow what we do in Westminster has these enormous ripple effects. It's not to say that you can't use that platform for enormous good, but actually getting out into the country again and once lockdown's over and and trying to show that there is a better path for Britain and not just a, an opposition but an alternative, that's something that really preoccupies me. One of the things that Keir's been doing since, during lockdown is these it's called call Kia, which you can make of that what you will um but it actually is really important where you know he's been getting people from different parts of the country to come together to talk to him about their priorities for the future seems to me that's quite an important thing to do at this moment and particularly to do that around particular areas because i think one of the things that's come out of covid is that community matters place matters to people it's part of what anchors and grounds us and people feel very deeply about their connections to other people their you know physical and social connections it's one of the reasons why i hate the phrase social distancing because i actually think one of the things about covid is that it's made us socially connect um, even if we've had to physically distance and that there's an important lesson there for us in all of that. So just remind us what grounds and roots Lisa Nandy. Just tell, just tell us where you come from and, like, you know, and, and why you're the political actor that you are now. I mean, I suppose like most people, I don't know all the answers to that, but um, I don't know what's the answer to that. I mean, I, I grew up, I grew up in a, in the 1980s in a time that was very politically angry and so one of the th things that I saw during that time is just how much the country was battered apart by all of that. That was a, a lot to do with the, the government that was in place at the time. It felt like your government was actively working against you, um, not just not helping but, but actively in opposition to the community that I grew up in but there was more than that I suppose is that it just didn't feel like there was a serious attempt to try and bring people together I think that's one of one of the reasons why I was very attracted by the messages that Compass has always promoted and why I joined Compass long before I became a member of parliament or even a councillor um, because I've always felt that nobody has a monopoly on wisdom and bringing people together and having more people in the room and part of the conversation is the only way that you build lasting change and in the end the only way that you get the right answers um but i think that comes from my family as well you know my dad's from india he's a marxist you know my political my family spans a very wide political spectrum mm. um my mum's labor my granddad was liberal we've got every sort of disagreement around our dinner table on christmas day that you could imagine but it's it's important to me is that you have something to learn from lots of different places and I think we've lost that sense really in in politics over recent years it's become very angry and tribal and the country has suffered as a result it's one of the reasons why I love the the brief that Keir asked me to take on because I think in the end foreign policy is about building those alliances and we you know we might disagree and we might challenge sometimes we might challenge very very hard but um there, there is a you know, wide coalition to be built in British politics that has defence of democracy, human rights, the rule of law, and the best interests of the British people um, at its heart. And, you know, I'm enjoying the fact that we can reach out and build those alliances through the front bench. And um, let's just kind of carry your life for, you know, tell us what, the, what did you learn from the um, leadership election? Um, what did you discover in those kind of <laughs> not, months? Not to run for leader. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that may well be a, a, a an obvious one. But kind of, what did it tell you about the state of the party or the state of the country? Or you know, how do you think differently as a consequence of going through that election? Um, I mean, it really is like walking through fire. I've never done anything that exposing, and mm. you know, it's a difficult one because people had said, "Well, you couldn't possibly win a leadership contest with the." Brexit position that you held I mean I you know I took a position quite early on that we had to bring people together find a deal maintain close alliances with Europe but 
respect the result of the referendum. That was an enormously controversial thing. And, you know, particularly within the Labour Party and people said, well, you can't possibly win. Of course, I didn't win the contest. But I think really what, what we managed to do, I was proud of that campaign. because I think what we managed to do was to give people a sense of what politics can be. We brought people together. You know, at the outset, nobody thought it was possible that I could win Walthamstow and Wigan CLPs nobody thought it was possible that the chair of Labour Friends of Palestine could win the backing of the Jewish Labour movement. We brought together GMB, the biggest energy union, with activists like George Monbiot arguing on climate change, arguing side by side for change. Only a few months after, on the conference floor, Labour had absolutely broken apart over that very issue. And so, you know, I was proud of that. And I was proud of the fact as well that we managed to set a tone and a culture that was very different. I've never seen a leadership contest where the three you know, finalists or the finalists in that contest quite clearly liked and respected one another. Mm. And I, you know, I knew Keir very well when I went into that contest. We'd had differences of opinion over how to handle Brexit, but politically we're very similar and personally we get on very well. I didn't know Becky as well at all. And by the end of it, we'd become really good friends. And I think people could see that. And you know, we, I said at the end that we were competitors in that contest, but we were never opponents. I just don't see it like that. In the same way that I, you know, I don't see Caroline Lucas as an opponent or an enemy either. And I think that's, we did something quite important for the Labour Party and quite important for politics too. So it was, it was tough. It was really, really hard. But I think it was important that I did that and that we did that as a team. Uh, I think the Labour Party came out stronger and I think politics came out stronger as a result. And I kind of look at Keir, who I, I don't know that well, but he seems an incredibly decent, professional, hardworking person. Um, but my word, he's going to need reservoirs of cultural, intellectual and organisational depth in order to make the most of this opportunity. I mean, you know, where, 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 you know, where does the party see, you know, where, where do you see those coming from in order to arm us with the ammunition and the guile we need to navigate the next few years? Well, I think that he, you know, one of the things that I, I think I knew about him before, but I've certainly got to know a lot more since I took on the brief and, and formed part of his team, is that he's very good at, you know, understanding what he doesn't know. It's quite an underrated quality in politics, mm. I think. There's a humility there that is important. And that he's, he's maybe this comes from the sort of training as a lawyer, but he likes to probe the argument from every side. And so he's genuinely interested in what people have to say that is different, not just the same. I've seen a lot of political leaders, left and right, surround themselves with people who tell them the same thing and fi find ways of reaffirming their instincts he's he's very very good at sort of challenge and reacting to challenge um and he likes to build broad teams and broad conversations um and i like that as well um so i think this you know there's something starting to happen in in labor that is is interesting I, you know there's there's a sort of factional war that we've been having in the party that i just don't think reflected the reality of most of the labor movement that you know you were either pro Corbyn or anti Corbyn, you were of the left or of the right, and and actually you know some of my closest friends in Parliament span that spectrum. The people I've learnt most from span that spectrum. Found themselves on different sides of that argument, you know, pro Remain, pro Leave, and actually most of us could see, you know, the world in in colour, not in black and white, and. I think that's what we're starting to be, find again in the Labour movement. It's not that, you know, there were parts of what happened over the last few years in the Labour Party that I think did that quite successfully. You know, one of the things that Jeremy and his team did was to reach out to, I suppose, the slightly more radical part of the party. And they helped to bring a sort of dynamism and an energy and fresh thinking to the party that had been missing, certainly for the five years before that, that I'd been in Parliament. And it does feel quite refreshing that we've retained a lot of that, uh, that we're not scared of that anymore, but equally that we're not shutting out people who want to challenge that and push back against that and disagree with it. So I, I think, it, I, I suppose where it comes from is what I once heard Zoe Williams say at a Compass event, actually, which is about being porous. 
um, having more people in the room, being able to hear what they're telling you, being open and alive to all of that and building those very big, strong networks. So in my brief, for example, we've been reaching out not just to world leaders, um, but to civil society as well across the world and trying to understand not just, you know, what's happening with Trump in America or Z in China, but actually what the Chinese people feel, what the American people feel that is driving some of that, trying to understand the nuance and the complexity. And that can only come from having much broader networks, much deeper conversations with a bigger range of people. Well, let's, let's get into that a bit more, because I, I mean, I sort of, you know, like everybody else, watch the scenes on our television screens over the weekend of kind of largely kind of burly looking white men, you know, protesting and whatever. And the kind of the polarisation of our country on those scenes, on social media. And you're just thinking, and I'm going to get slaughtered for this, but I'm thinking, like, how did those people get like that? What was it about their lives and their economic and social and family circumstances that got them to that place? You know, and how do we begin to undo that and understand what they think? Um, and shift the debate rather than just, you know, polarising it even further. And that's happening across social media, across so many areas. I mean, we'll get into the towns and cities thing, but that's another fulcrum for that kind of division. How do we develop a politics which has, you know, proper conversations and, and develops new positions rather than just embeds, you know, difference and that black and whiteness? So I was smiling when you said those burly white men protesting in the streets. I thought you were talking about yourself. Yeah, um, good thing. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, I suppose, first of all, that I think people don't know each other very well. And we've lost the ability to understand each other because we just don't know one another. You know, it's one of the reasons why I've always had what people say are quite radical views about education. You know, I don't like free schools and academies as a model. I, I dislike private education and the reason that I do is because I think it shortchanges all kids not just poor kids but actually it stops young people from learning and knowing one another and that is one of the richest things that you can in terms of education that young people can have so I think there's something about that is that you know over the last few years especially with Brexit I felt like every time I would come down to London I would meet friends who you know they'd had horrendous racial abuse they've been told that they were liberal elites for voting remain they felt horribly unfairly characterized and they felt they were losing their country but then I would go home to Wigan and my friends my neighbors my constituents would have been tarred as you know too stupid to understand the question too racist to care they were really really angry about being brandished uneducated because they they just happened to have taken a different and quite thoughtful view about our political arrangements and it just struck me so much that people didn't know one another. So I think that's that's the first thing. But I also, I think that there's a danger that we play into these culture wars too much. Um, you know, we've seen a development in American politics, but in British politics as well, and right across the world, where you've got political actors, whether they're in government or uh, civil society or, you know, opposition parties trying to ignite culture wars in order to further their own ends. And I think the debate about the statue is very similar. In Wigan, we've been having a very live debate about statues over the last three years because the only statue we have in the middle of Wigan town centre is to the, the only Tory MP the town's ever had. And to a lot of people, that strikes them as a nonsense when we've never had a proper monument to our mining industry. So in the last three years, the council responded to the level of public anger about that and have erected not just a statue to an unnamed man, woman and child, which is important because not to airbrush the women and children that helped to power this country and build our wealth and influence at great personal cost. But they've also erected a statue to Billy Boston, who many of you will know is one of the best rugby league players this country's ever produced um still lives in Wigan and is loved he's also one of the only black rugby league players certainly of that era and that generation I think that tells you that actually this thing about you know people in London feeling very or Bristol feeling very angry about statues and people in Wigan wanting to defend them actually no these debates matter to people they matter all over the country and we shouldn't make the mistake of of playing into those culture wars or somehow accepting that people are fundamentally different we aren't and what we what we celebrate in our public spaces matters to all of us and we can have a sensible debate about it with more light and less heat um, and it's the job of progressive politicians to make sure that we do yeah, yeah. 
and take that into your you know let's just focus uh, just for a, a couple of minutes on your work around towns um it, what is the new job going to help that at all you know are you going to discover different things about different towns in different countries are we going to learn lots more lessons are, is there a universality to this kind of this divide i mean seemingly at one level there's a divide which which has felt greater than 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 the recent past in terms of that cultural division between cosmopolitan and communitarianism between towns and cities between settlers and pioneers and whatever way you want to cut it and we're really keen at compass to work out how we build those bridges and how do we build understanding so you know where have you got to on that um so a friend of mine texted me after i it was announced that i um, accepted this position to say that is a lot of towns you're now responsible for <laughs> <laughs> that i've taken over all the towns in the world um it's so um i suppose there we've when i set up center for towns with some friends will jennings and ian warren a few years ago one of the first things that struck us was that this is not just a british phenomenon this growing apart yeah. of two groups of people we've been seeing it for 40 years in britain but we've also seen it in the usa where fewer than a hundred thousand former democratic voters in the rust belt um, put trump into the white house seen it in australia uh, the australian labor party done a lot of work in thinking over this they had their own version of the culture wars um, but not through brexit through climate change long before we started to see it here um, it's a phenomenon in france in germany in austria seeing it all over the world and it is really really damaging the left as well we just haven't known how to respond to all of this it's one of the reasons why i wanted to reach out to to, to understand what was happening in those places and to build those coalitions so for example we've been reaching out to try and build links between some of our towns that have seen 40 years of economic decline here in britain and some similar towns over in the united states as well who've been hit by exactly the same global trends i think we're facing a moment a really huge moment once the immediate public health crisis from covid has receded where the world is going to choose whether we pull together or whether we break apart and already you can see these voices appearing on the global stage attacking our multilateral institutions um, arguing for protectionist barriers closed borders scapegoating migrants there has to be another pole on that global landscape and that's one of the reasons why we've been reaching out and building those links those networks those connections it's one of the reasons also why i'm really energized about the brief because actually this is a moment where being in opposition you can actually change things and be a force for good at the moment we've got a government in britain that is very i mean it's all over all over the place in its in relation to foreign policy it doesn't know whether it wants to be a global player or isolationist it doesn't know whether it wants to you know work with china or the us or uh, form alliances with with european partners and i think labor and working with other political parties has to show that there is a another pole on that landscape and win that argument over to Grace in just a second, um, but just uh, uh, the payoff line any, any, any part of your response, you say, I know Neil, it's bloody complicated, isn't it? Um, <laughs> but it, but it, but that's why we called it this because it is local, national, it's global, it's town, it's city, it's black, it's white. You know, how do we, you know, we need a politics that can deal with all of this complexity. Um, uh, uh, you know, is the Labour Party able to change itself into being, you know, the biggest tent? And we'll, we'll get on to, you know, in the questions of progressive alliances and PR and all of that stuff. You know, does Labour, you know, is Labour seeing itself as a fulcrum point in that complexity and can open out to all of those different shades? I mean, I, I think that there's been a sort of, I think there's an urgency to progressive politics everywhere now. I, I certainly felt it shift during the course of the leadership contest. I think the, the December election in Britain was probably one of those moments. Talking to friends over in Australia, um, in the Australian Labour Party, I think they had a similar moment with their elections as well. I mean, we've been out of power now for 10 years. We've had 10 years of Tory-led rule. And the country is, you know, in a lot of ways, in a worse shape than I've seen in my lifetime. And all over the world lights are going out for people including here in britain and um, we had this moment today where the, the government decided that their 
response to this global pandemic was just going to be to abolish our aid department. You know, you can feel these lights going out all over the place. And it was um, the former Australian Prime Minister, Ben Shifley, who said that Labour has to be the light on the hill for people. And um, these are really dark times. I think there's a, there's a moment here where we can start to reach out and, and build a very broad group of people who are capable of, of advancing this situation. And I suppose what I'm trying to say is we've got to win. There's, there's not going to be an election until 2024. We've got to win that election. And we've got to win that election and become a moral force again and make Britain into a moral force again in the world, a progressive force. And that means that we need to bring people with us, the broadest possible alliance. And I've, you know, I've always, I've always believed in that. It's not that, you know, it's not just that I want to see a Labour government, it's that I want to see a better, different country. So yes, I think, I think this is a moment. I think it's a really big moment. I think this is a completely changed progressive landscape in Britain than it was four months ago. And we, the, the challenge is, how do you maintain that over the next four years and progress that and that's where I think organisations like Compass come in and become really really important. Hello this is Grace from the Compass office interrupting for a moment. I'm lucky enough to come from a large and politically diverse family. We really did have the full political spectrum represented over Christmas dinner but in spite of our differences we still actually like each other. Um, I've always known because of this that politics should be more about listening and learning from the people we disagree with than shouting at them and fighting with them and of course I've definitely known for a long time that it really is bloody complicated so I was so happy that when one day I discovered Compass quite by accident through their brilliant work on the Progressive Alliance in the 2017 general election Since then, it's been an absolute pleasure to once again be part of a political family where talking to people in different political parties, admitting that you alone don't have all the answers, is not just okay, but actively encouraged. So if you'd like to find out more about Compass, you can visit compassonline.org.uk. And now, back to the conversation. In terms of uh, sources for hope, let's turn to Grace and um, the 100 plus people who are on the call listening in and the questions they've got. So over to them. Thank you, Grace. All right. Okay. Yeah, lots of questions. So we'll try to get through as many as possible. First up, I wanted to bring in um, Jane Drapkin and also Kieran, because you both had questions which really complement each other. So Jane, if you want to go first, if you can speak. Thank you. Um, Hi, Lisa. Uh, Thanks. Fascinating listening to you. I just wondered what your thoughts are on the merger announced today of DFID and the FCO. Um, Do you think this is the nail in the coffin of the provision of development aid on the basis of need and the start or perhaps the reinforcement of aid being provided only on the basis of strategic benefit to the UK? Um, And then, so Kieran, if you can now speak, your your question was quite, was kind of a follow up to that, which worked quite nicely. So, yeah, my point linked to that is I'm assuming you're against what was announced today, but I have a suspicion that many poor working class people in the UK would very much like sentiments around charity begins at home. How do we go about selling, defending overseas aid when there's huge poverty in the UK? How do we do that? Okay, got compass it's like a level maths all over again um thanks for both of those i suppose so the first part of that is is around the merger and i mean i think if you listen to boris johnson there's long been a a desire in the tory party to um to try to roll aid into the foreign office to use it just as a tool to advance um a, a, a sort of what they call Britain's interests, but really over the last decade has largely been about chasing trade deals and chasing growth. I don't think we've had a foreign policy in Britain for a decade. Our way of engaging with the world has been almost exclusively through an economic lens. And it's got us into a real mess. You know, you only have to look at Huawei, for example, to see what happens when you take that approach. We're now in a position where we've lost our own homegrown industries around 5G we're being squeezed in a trade war between China and the US and we don't have the friends and alliances that we need elsewhere to deal with that. So 
you know, it's, it's been a strategically wrong-headed approach for a decade. And I think what you saw today is, is the latest in a long line of that. I also think it was a very cynical move. As Keir said at the dispatch box, there was absolutely no reason for the government to make this statement today. It was rushed forward in advance of a review that is stalled for, for months um, into Britain's role in the world. And um, the reason that the government announced this today was really largely to distract from their own failings at home in the COVID crisis. I think it's a, a real problem. Um, but, you know, in truth, I think that there's been a lot of pressure on DFID for some time from this government in order to use aid as a tool for the pursuit of economic policy. And I think it's really important now that we stand up and provide not just an opposition, but an alternative to that as well. Um, and Kieran, on your question about, about winning this argument with the public, I, I don't think the characterisation is right, if I'm honest. I, one of the things that really hit me today was that this this was clearly when Boris Johnson used the line about cash machines, you know, the diffid has been this sort of great big cash machine in the sky or whatever he said. It was obviously the latest version of the culture war that the Tories have tried to ignite every day now for a week on different issues in order to try to divide us from one another and distract attention from the handling of the COVID crisis. Actually, though, if you look at public attitudes in different parts of the electorate, there is a very, very strong uh, alliance across very different parts of the electorate in favour of anti-poverty initiatives and Britain showing global leadership. In fact, anti-poverty is the one area that unites the so-called metropolitan liberals in the cities and the so-called red wall parts of the country outside. So I think I think the Tories are making a huge strategic mistake here, not just on this issue, but just generally. I think they completely underestimate people in the areas that they just won. I think they like to characterise those parts of the world as somehow uncaring, um, uninterested in what happens elsewhere in the world, inward looking. Uh, and actually, none of those things really are true. So, you know, I think this is strategically a mistake for them. And I don't think that we should accept that characterisation either. The, what you saw happen today in the House of Commons was essentially a government that was trying to remove support free school meals for children in this country over the summer holidays failed and then went out to try and distract attention by removing aid and support from children across the world. I mean, this is just deeply, deeply cynical. I think it's going to be really unpopular with the public as well. And I think we can win that argument. OK, um, so on the subject of culture wars, there was Kathleen who had a really good question about that. Kathleen, you should be able to speak to us now. I was really wanting to ask a question about whether, um, given the majority that the party have, the Tory party have, how we can get Parliament to be able to scrutinise and make the government accountable. I agree with you, the public will be incensed with the decisions they're making, but how can we put pressure on them for parliamentary processes to stop them or to try and stop them? Um. Well, it's a good question to which I don't have all the answers, but, you know, one of the things that I think is a problem at the moment, and it's been a problem over the last few months, is that Parliament hasn't really been sitting. And when I say sitting, I don't mean this bizarre conga that Jacob Rees-Mogg set up, where we all prance around in circles for hours, pretending that that's somehow democratic scrutiny. But actually, even when we had the, the hybrid system set up where people could beam in from across the country to ask questions the parliamentary sitting time was very abridged for no good reason actually because um you know it's not like this government has a huge legislative agenda that it's trying to push through for the benefit of britain um so you know we've been fighting a lot of those battles labor hasn't been alone in that we've been working with other political parties to do it it sounds boring to the public but it's actually really really important um, I think you'll see a lot of that cross-party working in this parliament as well. It's certainly when it was announced that DFID was being abolished and merged with the Foreign Office today in the chamber, there was a huge sort of cross-party move to try to, to oppose that. So I think you will see more of that cross-party working. I think that's really important. 
Um, and, um, you know, I think we're going to have to think about tools, not just in Parliament, but outside of Parliament as well. I mean, we, we've been running a campaign to try and get the government to take seriously the fact that there were children who were about to go starving hungry over the school holidays in this country because of COVID and school closures. And, you know, we had an opposition day debate. We had a vote that we were going to push to the vote at seven o'clock this evening. We were expecting to lose it, but we were going to do it because it was the right thing to do. And then all of a sudden you have this amazing young footballer who stands up and sh morally shames the Tories into action, you know, gives voice to something that people feel very, very deeply out there in the country. And within hours, the government has had to cave in to pressure from us, from their own backbenches, from other political parties, but most of all from this groundswell that he managed to, to, to ignite. So I think we're just going to have to think much more creatively about how we, how we take these things on and win them over the next few years. Okay, um, so next up I had James Cracknell, who I think will ask a question. If, can you speak? Yeah, okay, we've got James. Go for it. Thank you. Hi, Lisa. Um, both yourself and Keir Starmer have talked positively about voting reform, but without explicitly committing the Labour Party to proportional representation. What is holding the party back from making that commitment and what can we do to persuade you? Um, so I think there are mixed views within the Labour Party as a whole. There are some very strong proponents of proportional representation, but there are also people who are concerned about it. I have had concerns about it. I have concerns about first past the post as well, um, because I think it needlessly divides us from one another on the progressive uh, side of politics. But I also believe that the constituency link is important. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I was able to hear and to understand the damage that was being done in parts of the country like mine through the debate about a second ref referendum, which hasn't gone away, a sort of long-standing sense that people are being disrespected and shut out of the conversation. Um, and so when we did the book that Neil mentioned at the beginning, I'm not trying to plug it, I'm not even sure you can buy it anymore, but the book that Caroline Lucas and Chris Bowers and I did a few years ago called The Alternative, we actually devoted an entire chapter to this and the different types of proportional representation that there are because there are some types of PR that do preserve the constituency link and they're the, that's the sort of electoral reform that I'm very attracted to. So I think that's one of the problems is that, you know, that if you remember back, back in the days when we were doing the AV referendum, that was part of the problem because you have people in the Liberal Democrats saying, well, hang on a minute, this isn't what we consider to be PR. And so the, the coalition was already fractured i think the other problem though and this is this is my concern with it is that sometimes it's seen as a a panacea by the left i'm not saying you think this or that everybody thinks this but it's seen as the way that we're going to fix this rather than actually winning the argument and actually with with brexit i really felt that that was the problem is that for decades we hadn't even been having the argument about global cooperation about participation with other european countries we hadn't been thinking seriously about what reform of those institutions would look like so that they were far more democratic, far more accountable, far less remote to a lot of people. And it, it, if, if we're not careful, it becomes a tool that can be used to further divide us and to exploit the culture wars where we split into tribes and we just slug it out. Now, I'm not saying that that's inevitable under PR, but what I am saying is that we do have to win the argument. There is no substitute for that, not least because if we want to implement PR, you have to win an election. And to win an election, you've got to win on the first past the post. So we've got to win the argument first before we can even get to the point where we're in a position to change things. Okay, thanks. Um, so zooming back out to the international, uh, John Bloomfield, can you hear us? And if so, do you want to ask about a question you had? Uh, hello, Grace. Hi, Lisa. Um, I want to ask just on China. Um, uh, what policy should Labour be following uh, on China and how would you distinguish it from that that Trump and the Tory hard right, Tugan Hart and Duncan Smith and co are following? Um, really good question. I think that um, we need a twin pillar approach to our engagement with the Chinese government. Um, the first is that I think we've seen the problems with what I think has been quite a naive approach 
to China, the Chinese government and Chinese investment over the last decade, even last year, Philip Hammond. I mean, it seems, seems odd to think that last year Philip Hammond was the chancellor, but such is the speed with which politics moved. moves. Last year, Philip Hammond, as the chancellor, was still talking about the golden era of um, British Sino relations. And actually, um, there's been a, there, there, there is a problem with the 5G network and the involvement of Huawei with the, 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 the way in which the government has approached investment in nuclear power and Heatley Point is one example, but there are others in the offing as well. We haven't invested in our homegrown industries and so we're now in a position where our own security services essentially say that we, um, that we Huawei, which is classified by the security services as a high risk vendor, um, you know, we're, we're looking at that as being the only game in town. We shouldn't be in this position as a country. We need far greater strategic independence. And, you know, if there's any, you, know, you need any convincing about that, just look at what is happening in Hong Kong at the moment and the way in which when the government did finally stand up and say loudly and clearly that they were prepared to defend the rule of law, human rights and democracy in Hong Kong, China threatened countermeasures against the British government. So we've got, to, we've got to have more strategic independence. That is partly about building those homegrown industries here in the UK, but it's also about building alliances overseas as well um, with other democratic countries, whether that's France, Germany, Italy, Spain, New Zealand, Australia, Japan, you name it. There are other powers who find themselves in a similar position and at the moment, we're in the worst of all possible worlds because we have no strategy at home and we have no strategy abroad. But the second part of this, and this is where I think Labour will always differ from some of the more hawkish Tory backbenchers, is that there is no global problem that can be solved without a relationship with the Chinese government and the involvement of the Chinese government. And so Labour, Labour the country, Britain, has to have a constructive engagement with China on climate change, on COVID-19, we've just seen how important that is. And one of the things that concerns me about this debate is how it very quickly morphs into anti-Chinese sentiment. So here in Britain over the last few months, we've seen, particularly because of COVID, we've seen attacks on Chinese businesses, on Chinese people, verbal attacks, physical attacks. I think it's really important that we reiterate that our relationship with the Chinese people has always been strong. And it's always been important, those cultural exchanges, you know, students, the, the work that the universities do together. And at the moment, you hear, you know, particularly with the rhetoric coming out of the current administration in America, you hear this very anti-Chinese government sentiment that morphs into anti-Chinese sentiment. I think it's really important that when you look at something like COVID, we draw a distinction between the actions of the Chinese government in the early days of the pandemic and the actions of Chinese medical researchers, scientists, and those brave doctors who blew the whistle on what was happening. They've continued to work with global partners over the last few months even at times when it's got politically very difficult and there's been very little political support for doing so and I think we need to draw that distinction quite clearly that collaboration is going to continue to be important for Britain and the world. Christopher Owen said one of your predecessors spoke about an ethical foreign policy is this an idea that appeals to you? Um, so I, absolutely uh, the, uh, restating a commitment to human rights and what Robin called foreign policy with an ethical dimension is really important, not least because we've had a decade of seeing our relations with other countries through the lens of uh, economic growth and trade. And because actually what we've seen, particularly with COVID, but also with global challenges like climate change, is that our alliances with other countries are incredibly important. In the last few months, you've seen France stepping up to try and get a global ceasefire agreement, seen Australia leading efforts to get a global agreement around the vaccine. In the end, the only way that you defeat COVID-19 is by defeating it everywhere and making sure that the world's poorest as well as the wealthiest have access to not just the vaccine, but treatments and diagnostics as well. We've seen those, those powers stepping up. Those alliances are really important. What is the basis of those alliances? It's human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. So standing up for those interests, it's, there's been a sort of attempt to characterise that as a sort of head versus heart argument. 
actually it's in Britain's interest, it's in the world's interest to do it. It's morally the right thing to do, but it's also the only way that we're going to build a safer, more secure world. Okay, nice. Um, so next one, so it's Mark Jackson changing the topic yet again. Um, Mark, can you hear us? And if so, would you like to ask your question? Hi, Lisa, how are you? Hello. All right, thanks. Except I'm getting some quite odd looks on this street, to be honest, but I'll <laughs> <laughs> plow on. <laughs> well, what are your ideas about building back better? And does it include the Green New Deal? And out of office, how do we create the momentum to get the Tories to accept it? For example, uh, with the, uh, the red wall, the, the, the term blue, how can we, how can we get them back? Um, so I, I think there's been a, a sort of shift really in terms of, you know, when I first started talking about towns way back in, God knows when, 2016, I think, when I started talking till I was blue in the face about what's happening in our towns, there wasn't really much intra political interest. Now it feels very central to the whole political debate. And part of that agenda is about how do you create, how do you bring people together? How do you create an agenda that works for people in different parts of the country who've had different experiences of globalization, who whose economies are very different? You know, the, the economy of Manchester, where I grew up, is very different from the local economy in Wigan. Um, so how do we how do we create a future that works for both? Now I think there is a a growing cross party consensus on the need to invest and to have an investment program that works in all parts of the country, not just in some parts of the country. So that's a very welcome thing. Um, and obviously the green economy is one of the fastest growing areas of the economy. So I think you might see some some level of cross party consensus on that. I'm not saying that you know, the Tories are suddenly going to start hugging Huskies again and uh, and shouting vote blue, vote gr go green or whatever it, they used to say. But there's, I think there is a, a bit of consensus around that, that we, we might be able to help. Where I, I think there's a, a huge difference, I suppose, is that um, I, I think what the, this Tory government doesn't really understand is that the clamour for change that we saw expressed through Brexit and then we saw during the December election last year is not just a clamour for investment, it's a clamour for power and people having the ability, ability to shape their own lives, shape their own communities, make their own choices. You know, when I talk to young people in Wigan, last year I was talking to young people in Wigan and we also went to talk to young people in Hastings about what they wanted from the future. And there were two groups of young people that we found in both places. One group who want to, to leave home, they want to spread their wings, they want to see the world, they want to get new opportunities and experiences. Very like me, I wanted to do that at that age. Another group of young people who wanted to stay at home, near their families, in the place that they knew and loved and they wanted to contribute. Neither of those groups of young people felt that they had any of those choices available to them. So we failed on every single front and I think that this is one of those reset moments where we've just got to start offering people real choices and opportunities, not the choices that we think they should have. It's one of the reasons why I've always disliked the, the sort of way in which social mobility is framed in Westminster. The idea that, you know, we're all climbing up this ladder towards this sort of shining example of somebody who goes to Oxbridge and then works in the city and lives hundreds of miles away from their family. If you want to do that, that's great. And that's, you know, let's give you the chance to do that. But let's accept that people have different priorities different things that matter to them and that they care about and let's start giving people real choices in their lives i think covid has been one of those moments people have rediscovered some of the things that they'd forgotten mattered to them and i think this is a moment maybe where we don't just reset policy but we reset the values on which we build that policy mm, okay um oh yeah i think this is going to be the last one from the members so finn jensen had a really quick and simple question about progressive alliances. Knew it was coming. Finn, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, hi Lisa. Um, hi. Just wanted to ask um, um, uh, whether Labour uh, want to uh, draw up some sort of uh, progressive alliance with other progressive parties up to the next general election. Um, and um, 
whether uh, Labour would be willing to negotiate that uh, some other parties might uh, be the main candidate in one constituency. But to ensure that uh, the progressive vote doesn't split and let the Tories in again, or does Labour see themselves as you really have a chance to get a majority on your own without um, uh, having any alliance with other progressive parties? And um, so, good question, big question, a uh, big tactical question, but also a values based question, I guess. So, um, first thing I would say is that I believe that we can beat the Tories. Um, I believe that we can win the argument with the British public because in the end, I think that we're a better country than the Tories would have us believe. We're a decent, open, tolerant, self-confident country that you know we've seen during the COVID crisis looks after people, looks after the most vulnerable, cares for one another. I believe that we can do better. So, I, you know, I don't think that we should ever approach progressive alliances from a position of weakness. I think we should approach it from a position of strength. And one of the things that I've always, you know, Caroline Lucas and I discussed it often, I've always said is that I don't believe in working with other people from different political traditions because I have to. It's because I want to, because I believe that it's better and it provides a better politics and it provides better outcomes and it provides solutions that last. I'm sceptical about pacts. Um, we have already seen those growing up before. You know, we had... Um, in Berry North, where my friend James Frith booked the trend and almost held his seat and did brilliantly to do so. Um, we, we've seen quite long-standing cooperation now between the Greens and Labour to, to try and to try and advance us there. Um, but I, I, I worry about the fact that we're not giving the public a choice and actually to a lot of the public that's seen as a stitch up um, that denies them the right to vote for the people they want to vote for. Now, there was a moment when I, you know, say all of that, but there was a moment when I went out and led the charge for a progressive pact. And that was a few years ago with the help of Neil and Compass and Caroline Lucas and Johnny Reynolds, Clive Lewis, two of my friends who came and, and helped us to do that. And that was when Zach Goldsmith was standing for re-election in um, Richmond and having just won, run the most racially divisive campaign that I can remember in my lifetime against Sadiq Khan and I felt that was a real moment and the, 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 the local party, the Labour Party in Richmond felt very, very strongly, not everybody, it was, you know, there was a live debate going on but there were a lot of people in that party who felt very, very strongly that Labour shouldn't be running a candidate and that this was one of those moments that was so important that we had to lead by example and, and make sure that we got uh, Zach Goldsmith out and somebody from a more progressive party in. And so, I, you know, I think that level of cooperation is really important, it's a, but it's a values thing. It's not just a tactical expedient thing. It's about standing up for the sort of country that we want. But I think the job over the next few years is just for us to go out and win the argument with the public and not just to show that we're in opposition, but to show that we've got an alternative. I think that's been one of the things that's been lacking on the left in recent years. And I think that we can we can we can prove that there is that again in the end people only vote left when they feel hope and optimism not when they feel fear and despair and that is the, the task at hand i think we need to build a broad alliance in order to build that argument and make that case and win that argument with the public and i'm absolutely determined that we're going to do it um thank you lisa just tell us briefly before we close two things firstly just tell us about and um, we're trying to give a shout out and a bit of support to local projects the Brick Project, is that a good project? Should we be supporting the Brick Project in Wigan? Yeah, it's am so it's amazing. Uh, they used to be just, uh, well, I say just, they used to be a homelessness charity. They still are, but they, they branched out into running a food bank a few years ago. And I went along, you know, like a lot of local MPs do, you go and clown around at your local projects. I went un undercover. I went in my jeans and T-shirt and, and worked in their back room for a bit because I just wanted to see how it actually worked rather than the official visit. And they had me packing cold boxes, which people may not know are basically, um, instead, of, instead of a normal parcel, a lot of people in Wigan now can't afford gas and electricity. So they pack cold boxes for families because they can't afford to cook the food. 
Um, so it's all cold food that doesn't need to be heated up. Um, and one of the things that I saw when I went there was how it wasn't just the fact that they were providing this service. It was that, you know, there was a mum with two young kids, a baby and a toddler who'd walked a couple of miles to get there. She was going to have to walk a couple of miles back with some heavy tins. Straight away when she walked through the door, there was an apology for keeping her waiting. They said it's going to take a few minutes. Hope it's OK to, to wait. It was just the dignity of that you know that exchange and the fact that she deserved to be treated with respect and she was having been passed from pillar to post um for the last few weeks looking for help and not find just finding a closed door and i watched her walk out of there with a head held high uh, before somebody chased her out the door and said would you like a lift back and i just you know i think there's something magic in what happens with those connections they're a lifeline for people not just because of the service that they provide but because of the way in which they do it that very human connection so yes definitely please support Good. them we'll give a big shout out and, and try and get some money up to the brick project and just finally and you've said it really i mean you, you talked earlier about lights going out and some lights are going out but there's an awful lot of lights going on and we see that encompass locally nationally internationally in a kind of age of collaboration that's trying to railing against the bureaucracy of the state, you know, where that doesn't work, and railing against the free market um, in mutual aid in all sorts of places. Where, do you, where does Lisa Mandy see hope for the future? I guess, you know, you asked me a, a little while ago about the Labour Leadership Contest and how, you know, maybe it had changed me. I guess, I, you know, I've always been quite hopeful and quite optimistic about things, I guess, because I believe in people. That's, you know, that's what we, we are on the left. Mm -hmm. and And that's, you know that's what we're about but um it's been so angry and so polarizing the debate inside labor outside labor over the last few years and actually during that leadership contest it wasn't just everywhere i went in the country i didn't just go and spend time with party members wherever i was we went to see things that were happening in that part of the world and the response was just incredible so you know the fact that we were interested the fact that politicians cared that we wanted to make things better and we were prepared to give voice to some of the things that people were doing and the fact that I could stand in um, London and talk about what was happening in Worksop and people cared about it that I could stand in Worksop and talk about the levels of child poverty in Manchester and people genuinely heartbroken and wanted to know what they could do to help I think there's a you know there's a there's a there's a sort of way that we've played into some of the divisions that have been artificially created in this country in recent years and actually I came out of that contest feeling that we are a better country than they would have us believe and we can be that again I did this event with uh, it was an interview with Danny Boyle during a leadership campaign and it came about because I kept talking about the 2012 opening ceremony of the Olympic Games that amazing moment where we came together we told a story about the Britain that we have been with all its honesty and complexity and we told a story about the, the values and the future and it felt that the country came together in a moment of inspiration and optimism and then very quickly everything unraveled and I said to him where is that country gone and he said it's still there it's just waiting for someone to give voice to it and I'm just absolutely determined that we are going to be that force and you know it's why I love working with Compass and always have and always supported what you do because I think you provide the space for that and you provide not just the sort of you know the practical debates that we need to have about how we get there but the hope the ambition the dreams and that is something that we can't ever lose because in the end that's what turns people out that's what changes things. Thank you Lisa and Andy and thank you for everyone on the call another Tremendous uh, conversation. Thank you so much. Um, next week, we'll be joined by Anthony Barnett, who's one of the country's sharpest thinkers and writers about politics, the nation and the world. We're in for another treat. Um, until then, thank you very much, Lisa and Andy. Go and get your train home from, from, <laughs> from Houston. Travel safely. All of you, be good. Keep safe. And for, like all of us, let's keep hopeful. Thanks very much. So... If you like what you've heard today and want to be part of a much more equal, democratic and sustainable future, a good society, then visit us at compassonline.org.uk forward slash podcast 
and you'll be able to join us live in future calls just like this one. You can tweet me at Neil, N-E-A-L underscore Compass or Compass at Compass Office. And if you've enjoyed this week's episode, please give us a rating. It will help us reach more listeners in the future. And it's only fair that they know it's bloody complicated too. <laughs>